You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. You know, even with uh, the green light, we have, we have chaotically gone between different storylines. And yet what we remain true to is I don't want to look at it, at it as a sequel. I want to look at it as an, you know, John Wick Chapter 2. Because what the, the Fast and Furious did so well is after the third one is they weren't sequels anymore. They were chapters. And I think those are the best, those are the best franchises to have. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Joining me today is Derek Colstead. Derek is a screenwriter of John Wick and jo- the upcoming John Wick 2. Derek, how are you doing today, sir? Doing well, man. Tired. I can't remember the last time I had a weekend, but those are good problems to have. <laughs> so, uh, so, Derek, just to get started, could you give us a little bit about your background? Yeah, uh, I grew up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, I'm 41 this year, and when I was a little kid in the early 80s, that's when the, the VHS boom happened. And, uh, you know, people ask me how I, I got into this. And, I don't know, you know, a lot of people don't remember, but like in line at Shopco or wherever you shopped, you would have a bargain bin of VHS tapes. And uh, my my mom would, would purchase them. And we didn't have cable. We could afford it. And on Sundays, especially Sunday nights, PBS would actually show like the conversation or the Godfather, that kind of stuff. And so I snuck downstairs and my love of movies, you know, just began there. And uh, what's really interesting, though, is, uh, you know, growing up in Madison, Wisconsin, you have a very red family, very conservative, but very supportive. Like, I didn't lie. I remember coming home from sneaking into a theater and they asked me what I had seen. And I had seen RoboCop, which any other kid would have gotten into some serious trouble about. But in reality, they they looked at each other after I told them and just said, hey, um, you know, uh, we should probably support him in this. And so... Uh, you know, being a Midwestern kid, though, the idea of getting into film was a dream. And so when I went to college, it was for business, but I kept writing and uh, became, uh, I worked for Dale Carnegie in Chicago. And what got me out here is my little brother called and he asked me how I was doing. And I broke down and just started crying. And I'm not an emotional guy. And the realization was I had to come out here to see if I was going to fail. It wasn't a matter of success, you know. And so I had my little golf TDI. And uh, half the backseat was taken up by a large fucking Dell computer and a CRT monitor. I drove out here, you know, and that was 15 years ago. And apparently 15 years is an overnight success. So that's a little bit of a background, man. And that was a great movie to pick, by the way, is Rubio Cop. Oh, dude, dude. Yeah, you, know, you know, the other favorite story I, I tell almost everyone I meet, uh, I was allowed to see, you know, Raise the Lost Ark, but uh, Temple of Doom was too demony, you know? Uh, so my parents went and saw it, and they got back, and I was so excited, and I had, my, I had my dad sit down and tell me that the movie, right? From the beginning, man, it was awesome. Uh, saw it three years later and realized my dad had fallen asleep in the movie and just <laughs> made up a story. Uh, it's still my favorite, man. <laughs> that that's absolutely did you actually when you saw the movie for for, for for fun when you finally saw the whole movie did you go wait a minute this is nothing like what my dad said well i, I could it was funny because i could tell the point where he fell asleep you know it was the opening sequence in japan which is you know just legendary and then you have that kind of slow jaunt between the first and second act and my dad my dad's notorious for falling asleep in movies, uh, most notably animated one, ones. And so, I, I mean, some of the stories we, we all share is we the movie would start and I'd hear from the end of the aisle, oh, it's animated. 30 seconds later, you heard him snoring. So good guy, but still. <laughs> Yeah, my uh, my dad uh, fell asleep uh, at, at Star Wars Episode One, and he had like afterwards somebody asked him about the movie, and he was like, "I had no, I I don't even remember anything." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you know, so Derek, when you say you know, you were you were in college for business, did you actually graduate with a, a degree in business? I did, I did, and I went. Uh 
got business administration and then a minor in English. Well, a lot of minors because let's be honest, it's pretty easy to get a bunch of minors. And then uh, I went and worked for the family company back in Maison, Maine, Wisconsin, which is Wick Homes, which uh, was a construction company. And then I moved to Chicago. And during this time, I was still writing, but I wasn't – I was writing short stories and screenplays. I wasn't really sending them off. Uh, I wasn't reading books about screenwriting. It's just – in college, I suffered from insomnia, and the only thing that could actually get me to sleep is putting my dreams down on page, you know? And it wasn't until uh, that phone call from my brother where it's like, fuck it, I gotta try, you know? So, so when, when, when you were writing, were you focusing on screenplays, or did you actually you know, focus on just writing, like, you know, short stories, long stories, or anything, anything in particular? You know, I have a huge respect for people who write novels uh, simply because, you know, in a screenplay, it's like fade in, exterior, interior. It's one sentence and you read a great novel and it's like, holy crap, they're spending time to just craft the world. And what I'm trying to do is tell a good story that fits in 90 minutes, you know. And so what I loved about screenwriting, what I still love about screenwriting is – uh, I'm notoriously fast, but more importantly, I can move from one story to the next. And that's why I like short stories as well. In fact, you know, when I was a kid, I was the guy who was teased at sleepovers because everything scared me. And so as a, you know, as a temperament to that, I, I got into reading Stephen King and Stephen King short stories to this day, you know, are, are a massive influence. And I still, you know, I have them all behind me on my bookshelf. I mean, that that's glory, dude. I can't, I want to do what he can do uh, in the short form, but he's the master. Oh, absolutely. Uh, did you have his book on writing? I do. It's one of the few books on writing that I, I, I've read. So, uh, just, what other books on writing do you do you recommend? You know, not many. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my thing is like, just write. Uh, you know, I remember someone. I don't know what the book was. Again, I'm. I'm more of a writer nowadays than a reader, but someone told me once about the 10,000 hour rule. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in reality, like I look at the stuff that I wrote even like four years ago and it, it pales into comparison to how I'm writing now simply because I've been doing it for so long that it's not writing, uh, in rewriting, especially that's where the skill comes in. It becomes like an algorithm. Like it becomes something outside of the English language. Like you, if you make one change on page three, you know the ripple effect, but you know what to look for. And to get to that stage, you just need to do it. So, you know, people are always like, get the bad screenplay out of you. In reality, it's like your first screenplay is terrible. And then you keep writing and writing and writing and rewriting. And at a certain point, you find your stride. Not saying that everyone will become a writer, but you get better over time. And the other thing, too, is especially when I talk to college kids nowadays, I watched the films of my grandparents and my, my parents. A lot of people haven't watched the films of their parents nowadays. Like, I'm very fluent in film. But a lot of people nowadays, when you hear they haven't seen Casablanca or The Godfather, or, you know, uh, you, you name them. Like, you look around my, my office, like Butch Cassidy or freaking Pulp Fiction or Miller's Crossing, which is arguably my, my best film, my best, uh, my favorite film. Uh, watch and write, man. Listen. Uh, what's that movie called? Castle what? <laughs> Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's, you know, it's funny. Uh, I heard uh, Robert McKee, uh, whenever he does one of his seminars, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you've read story by him, but he always shows Casablanca like day two or three or whatever. And he says, has anybody in here truly never seen this before? <laughs> and more and more people are, ra are raising their hands. And, yeah. you know, he's like, well, well, we're going to spend the next 10 hours on this movie. So, uh, you know, get, get, <laughs> get comfortable. It's funny, too, because, you know, you hear when people do their top 10 lists of films and you find yourself almost rolling your eyes like, of course, Citizen Kane. But then you put it in and you watch it. And at minute 30, like at minute five, you're like, God damn it, that's good. You know, and it, even if you're. You know, I, I know a lot of people who won't watch black and white films, which astounds me, you know, and yet you watch like, for instance, It's a Wonderful Life. Everyone's like, oh, that's a smarmy piece of Hollywood crap. It's an incredibly dark drama. I mean, he's killing himself. I mean, stuff like that. And when I encourage people to watch film, it's like, dude, ask your grandfather, ask your mom and dad, like what their favorite movie movies was, because even though, uh, you know, the timing of movies has changed. You look at the Bloomhouse horror movies compared to those in the 60s and 70s, they're sprinting, you know? Rosemary's Baby is really extremely slow. It's genius, 
but it's slow. But you you have to watch it at least once to respect what was going on. Like I, Lawrence of Arabia, you have to see once. I'm not going to watch it again. It's long. But you have to see it once, you know, just to know that everything on screen is real. They, they really shot that and to respect that and learn from it. Yeah, and very true. I remember uh, in one of my film studies class in college. Uh, by the way, uh, I have a degree in business administration too, and I write. So you and I are very similar already. Uh, nice. So nice. I, I, I got to admit, though, the BA degree is kind of bullshit. But you know, hey, we got it. <laughs> oh, every day of my life, I, I tell everyone how it's bullshit. Um, I, I sit here and go, like, when I still when I'm paying my student loan uh, payments, I'm like, what the hell did I learn? Yeah, but I think the big thing about college, though, is it, it really doesn't matter, like, you, uh, you know, what your degree is. You, you learn to learn. And I think, you know, when people don't go to college and come out here, great. If you do to go, go to college and come out here, great. But having a college degree gets you into the mailroom, you know, unless you know someone, you still need to have that, sadly. And, and uh, true, a lot of the uh, – of the, um uh, positions that I see too for like anything if you want to work at the studio or you know like f- for instance Comedy Central I just put uh, filled out an application to work there and um, uh, they all want a bachelor's degree like that's a minimum requirement you have to have a bachelor's in something you, you look at guys like you know Kevin Smith and Tarantino they are flat not not a flashing pan that's wrong saying they I mean they're one in a billion I mean these guys are incredibly talented forces of nature and yet they're one of a kind you know none very few of us are. You need to actually have uh, that degree in your belt to get into the industry. Uh, even when it comes to, but when it comes to like screenwriting or acting, they don't care. You know, good is good. Yeah, very true. And uh, especially too, because uh, you know uh, Tarantino, he just took a. I mean, from what I've heard, he just took like a two day film course to get the understanding. And then when he wrote Reservoir Dogs, that's where he met Terry Gilliam. And Terry Gilliam really said him, you know, this is what you have to do. And then when he finally got around to making Reservoir Dogs, he was like prime and ready. I mean, having Terry Gilliam sort of mentor you, I mean, that was just like, you know, one genius showing another genius the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I remember reading an article with Django about Django Unchanged and. He said the line that only Tarantino can say, and it was, I had to teach myself how to make a Western. No one else can say that. I mean, Tarantino is a guy who devours film, devours movies, and has a respect for the shitty ones as well, which he should. I mean, you can you can pile shit on uh, Roger Corman flicks and the stuff that, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, trauma has done. And yet you watch, you're like, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. And yet Tarantino loves it and he applies it, which is huge respect there. Yeah, I always heard Orson Welles too loved. I don't know if this is true or not, but he loved to like have film uh, parties at his house, and he would show like these odd movies, and yeah. people would be like, "What the hell are you watching, Orson?" And he was like, "No, this is this is just something unique." And they didn't know if he was like you know making a, a joke of everybody or uses as this you know playing this this practical joke on everybody, or if he was dead serious. Well, and that's what I love though about where we are techni- technologically. You know, when you think back that when I was in college, uh, you know. 20, 22 years ago, I didn't have email yet. There was no cell phone. And the only foreign movies that the uh, video place had were the douchey ones. Like, of course, it's good. It won the Academy Award, that kind of stuff. But then as time progresses, and I remember being living in Chicago and the video place down the way had a large Asian section. And suddenly you're introduced to Chow Yun-Fat and Jet Li. And you're like, holy shit. Well, how did I not know about this crap, you know? And now, you know, with Amazon and everything else, like, I can see movies like The Man from Nowhere. I can see movies like uh, uh, I Saw the Devil. Yeah, these ones that back in the day I might have stumbled across on cable, but now you're like, okay, I get it. Yeah, and, and it's very and it's very true too. Because I remember going to the video stores, and you know, uh, just having to like look at co- different covers and stuff like that. And I remember some of the first time I discovered yeah, movies I've ever heard of, and it's like you know, holy crap, this is freaking awesome, man. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny when you think back in the day. Uh, everything like in Madison was the video station, and you'd go in, and I I still have a couple of horror titles just kind of emblazoned on my brain because of how, how horrific the VHS box looked. And you end up finally seeing the movie, you're like, oh. <laughs> my friends and I used to have this like little game we used to play where whoever could find the weirdest box art, that's what like, we, like they had a, they would have different deals. Like I think it was it was five movies for five nights or whatever, yeah, and uh, for five dollars. 
And what we do is we find like the um, the, the craziest like box art, and whoever could find the craziest, that's one of the ones we would definitely rent, and then well, and stuff like that. Well, no, it's funny about that is we we used to do the whole like who can pick out the worst movie, right? And so you get two or three movies. The problem with worst movies is they're boring. You know, you've never. I mean, the the worst movies that are fun to watch are actually fun to watch. When you do that, let's find the worst. You're going to be going. You're just going to be looking at your your watch, going, "Oh God, it's still going." What was the worst movie you've ever seen by doing that? <laughs> uh, let's see. I would argue that Mansquito is up there, <laughs> um, and uh, they're kind of. I think the worst movies I've seen tend to be the uh, Friday night premieres on Sci Fi, and yet. What sci-fi did is they embraced it, you know, like Sharknado. I get it. You know, you're totally making fun of the shit you were trying to, you know, give us years ago. Um, I'll say this. I've only walked out of two movies. Uh, the first one was The Road to Wellville, which was with uh, Dana Carvey and a slew Matthew. of characters back in the day. Do you remember that one? Yeah, Matthew McConaughey was in that. Uh, uh, and uh, I forget who the, I forget who the uh, person was. But, yeah, I remember Road to Wellville. It was just it, it was all, and then the second one was Sliver with uh, Sharon Stone because it was like this psychosexual thriller that nothing happened and every time they had sex she like cried and after about twenty minutes I'm like yeah I, I kind of miss the sunshine right now <laughs> yeah Anthony Hopkins he was in Road to Wellville that's that's right that's right you know you know that movie was actually based off of uh, Kellogg yeah I know that guy I mean. The movie's crazy, but that that life story is even crazier still. I was really close to walk out of freaking uh, episode one, though. Yeah, I remember episode one didn't leave much of an impression on me either. And I and part of the reason I stayed is, you know, everyone I was with was a massive Star Wars fan, so they had like the uh, rose tinted spectacles on. But I was just kind of like going, this whole thing's a a cutscene of a PlayStation game. <clears throat> When I was when I first saw it, I you know I, I forget how old I was. I was like you know something's missing here. And I I I, I didn't my, my, at that point in time I, my my brain I didn't have an, I didn't wasn't into film like I am now you know, but something was was inside was telling me because I never felt this way about the original three. Like the original three, like I'll I'll just watch and like I'm entertained from beginning to end. Episode one, I was kind of like, what's going on? Who's doing? Who's this guy again? <laughs> also, it's like. Uh, the, the plot is the is, is like a political trade organization treaty thing. You're like, wait, this is what we're after. <laughs> well, you know, the, everyone becomes a cynic at some point because I remember seeing uh, Return of the Jedi in the theater uh, with with my family, a bunch of friends, and I, I was the guy. I was one of those guys who was a growing number leaving, going, I think I hate the Ewoks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I I don't really I haven't got to that point yet where I hate the Ewoks, but uh, you will look with time with age. I don't know why it just happens. <laughs> well, Harrison Ford hated him right away. Uh, he called him the Teddy Bear Picnic. <laughs> uh, you were at college, were were you know you you got your degree, you start writing, you're writing in your in your spare time, and you know, so where is it that you started to say like you know? Should I write screenplays? Was it before your brother called called you, or was it after your brother called you? No, I, it was actually in high school. We went. My family went on a, a Alaska cruise. We you know we saved up for this thing, and I wrote my first screenplay because I loved movies on um, in longhand on a yellow notepad, and uh, came back. And at the time, you know, we were, we had Word Perfect, and I, I built up a a template, and I wrote it and gave it to my mom, who. She gave me back my first notes, and they were brutal. And yet, looking back and reading that first screenplay and seeing her notes, she was actually being very kind. Uh, I think it was just I was I wanted to emulate what I loved, you know. And I loved, and I I still love movies, you know. And uh, short stories and movies were what I do, but I just wouldn't, wouldn't show anybody, you know. Uh, in fact, for a couple of years. Uh, the cousins, you know, I come from a large extended family. When I got someone's name, my uh, for Christmas, I would write them four or five stories and kind of bind it together, and that was my gift. And I just I enjoyed doing it. You know, it was never it was never work. And even now, like I would argue that 
your first draft of anything isn't work. That's fun. It's work is the rewrite and making 15 people happy and keeping it afloat, you know? Um, but to answer your question, man, I just, I watched so many movies and it gave me so much joy. I wanted to emulate that. So, so you know, you, know, you, you move you out to LA. LA. I, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. Um, so I moved move to LA, and then you you start writing again. Uh, you know, so like, what was your first you know professional screenplay, like you would call it? You know, uh, that that you actually were using as sort of like a to get your foot in the door, so to speak. And it's funny. Like, the first one to get my foot in the door was called The Wayfarer, and it was a it was a sci fi thriller in the vein of. Matrix by way of The Shining, let's call it. And uh, my two leads were African-American. And I got a bunch of movies. I mean, I got a bunch of meetings. And they were surprised because I'm a six-foot-two white dude with red hair, you know. <laughs> uh, they thought I was something else. But I, I was wanted to see uh, Denzel Washington and uh, – who's Murtaugh? I can't remember his name right now. From uh, 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 Dad's Danny Glover. Yeah, I wanted them I, – I wanted them paired up, you know. So I got a lot of meetings. And, uh, you know – what happens is I was used to the, uh, you know, the professional world, but you move out here and you get involved in the industry. It was different and it was hard. And, uh, I, uh, just kind of, I, I, I stepped away for a bit and then, uh, I stepped back and I did a couple of, uh, you know, what would you call them? Direct to DVD or VOD movies. One was the package and one was, uh, one in the chamber. And, uh, they were hard simply because uh, you look at you look at the package. They had like 12 days to shoot and you have very little money and you have people who don't care because they pocketed their paycheck and other people who did care because it was a movie, you know, and it was a movie they were part of. And so after after those two, I was close to quitting again because to pay the bills, even with those, I was doing a lot of nonprofit stuff like doing uh, uh, videos and websites for – NGOs and the like. And it wasn't until I, I read this, wrote the screenplay called Acolyte, uh, AKA Simple Man, that Sonia, who's we lovingly refer to as a script bitch, because uh, she's the first line of defense for quality. Um, she read it and she said, I think you should try again. And uh, a buddy of mine, Mike Callahan, who was a producer on those two uh, titles I mentioned, introduced me to uh, Mike Goldberg and Josh Adler, uh, who were at New Wave at the time. And uh, they saved me, you know, everyone in their life at some point has individuals who saved them professionally. And those two saved me and they, they brought me to where I am today. So, you know, just to dig a little deeper in, into the script, Derek, when you were right now, you, you you told me you you don't you didn't see read a lot of uh, screenwriting books. I don't know if you if you had read them at that point, but do you did you subscribe to any sort of of you know template? Uh, whether it's you know I don't know if you read Sid, Sid, Sid Field's screenplay or Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. Or I did read Save the, the Cat. I, I did read Save the Cat. That was great. Uh, I haven't read anything by Sid Field, but uh, I think my big thing is uh, when I was a little kid, I was a my whole family we were ravenous readers. You know, I would I would probably read a, when I was in grade school. I'd read a book a day, uh, just because you know I, I loved I loved reading, and I've always been imaginative. But when you read and see where other people's stories go, it's awesome. And uh, my favorite authors at the time were uh, Alistair McLean, you know, and uh, Dashiell Hammett, and Tom Clancy. And then when I was in, in high school, it was. Uh, shit. Who wrote the firm? That was um, crap. John uh, Grisham. Yeah, yeah that, it's it's on my bookshelf behind me. I could have just turned around. <laughs> <laughs> but but a lot of like especially Alistair McLean. Uh, you know, he wrote Guns and Navarone. And what I loved about his his stuff is if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, what's the movie? Uh, Ronan did it best. Is you know, at one point, Max says, asks the question, do I know you by way of the German or something like that? It's never addressed again. Um, but by just – by having that one line, the world kind of expands a little, you know, like a boop, boop, a little bit bigger. And Alistair McLean and Hitchcock especially, they would have these lines that made their, their movies seem bigger and more complex than they were when in reality they were very simple. You know, um, you, you take John Wick. I mean it's, it's a revenge story, but it, he's not – you know, I'll let people argue about it, but it's more than just the dog. 
you know? And I think the best movies are that. It's more than just the uh, sled, you know, Rosebud. It's more than just the ring. It's more than it's, – it's, it just it, – it hints at a larger purpose. And I think by not answering what that larger purpose is, that's where the movies I love come into play. Yeah, and I know exactly what you mean. It, you know, in in John Wick, you know, it is more than when they, when they, uh, you know, whatever happens to the dog. I don't. For anyone who hasn't watched it yet, uh, I, you probably should stop now and watch it, <laughs> and then come back because I am going to be talking. A little, I do want to delve in deeper in the movie, but uh, but yeah, you. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and you know, it, it is. I I always am fascinated when I ever, you know, talk to an accomplished screenwriter like yourself, Derek, who what they've read and what. Method methodologies they they subscribe to, because yeah. um, some people swear by Save the Cat, and I've had others here on the podcast who would say, "Don't ever even read it. Keep it away from you at all costs." Well, I, you know, everyone functions differently. Everyone learns differently. Um, I don't know. Like people ask me, like, where did these ideas come from? And to be honest, I don't know. A lot of it is, uh, you know, what I've read. And who you are and where you are and what you see and how you see it suddenly comes into play. Um, but what I tell everyone is as soon as you finish a screenplay, write the first page and the next one. Because it's kind of like you have to keep that flame stoked or else a lot of you – know, for me personally, and I've talked to other writers, is when I finish a screenplay, it's kind of depressing. you know, Because you've been with this story and now that's done, you're like, shit. You know, you, you were crafting this world and you, now you hand it off. You have to start the next one or else, you know, for some of us, you know, you know this you know, when you talk to writers, I understand a great deal why people turn to the bottle or turn to the needle or turn elsewhere. Because when you get to the end of that novel or you get to the end of that screenplay or even a short story, you feel very alone. Um, and, but if you keep it going, you feel very alive. So, Derek, I want to ask you are, do, do, are you a part of a writer's group of any, of any kind? I mean, meaning like, do you have like a group of, that you meet with me once a month just to exchange, you know, whatever you're working on? I, I, actually, I, I don't. Um, you know, Sonia is very, uh, she, she comes from a, a house of readers as well. And so, between her and Josh and Mike, they tend to be my readers. And, uh, but what I am a part of is, you know, a guy named, a uh, screenwriter named uh, Matt Altman uh, invited me to his screenwriter forum on Facebook. Or, I can't remember who, I think it was Josh who invited me. Anyway, um, and what's really cool about that is, at first, I don't want to do it until I, until after the first week, I realized it's just a bunch of people encouraging each other, and I think that's incredibly important. You know, to have that group of people that, when you have a question to ask, they're excited to answer because you were excited to answer them, and uh, I love it. Yeah, I'm a part of a writers group right now. Um, we we started about two years ago when uh, it was we all a friend of mine got inspired uh, because we. We were watching the Oscars and Tarantino gave a speech about Django and it just sort of hit me like a lightning bolt. And I was like, holy crap, why am I just not starting a writer's group with some of the people that I know in the area who I trust and just see what goes from there, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing though. It's like you – I'd argue almost in every capacity you can't be a solitary person even though I'm happiest alone. I'm happiest alone with my computer and – no music on and just I, I love that and yet I know if I stay within that bell jar I'll get worse because I have to have those outward influences to make what I do better and you know for those who write I'd, I'd argue you know seek out even on Facebook or any other site or even locally people who think like you because a lot of things that you worry about they do too and that's important to actually connect on yeah it's a very, very, very good point and uh, so you know, as we you know, we talk about writers groups and everything like that. You know, um, a little later, I wanted to ask you uh, another question. Sorry, sorry for the bad segue, but uh, I, I have a note in front of me. I want to ask you say, uh, after afterwards. But you know, as we're writing, you know, I, I you 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 had the Mayfairs, you know, you, and then you. I assume now, once you were done that, you started your next project. So, what was your next project after that? I don't know <laughs> because, because here's the thing is I, I write, I write a lot and I write fast, you know, and, but a lot of times too, and you might've been in the same place. Like a lot of times I write the story to get it on my head. Uh, it might not be good. 
you know, but at the same time, like, uh, it's haunting me that it's still in there. I, I think of, I think of stories as people in, in line at the bank, you know, if it's 15 deep, you're pissed, but if it's three deep, you're fine, you know? So I try to get those 12 out of the way. Um, the, but I would argue that, um, Acolyte, uh, which is, you know, making the rounds again, that one got me on the radar and it was John Wick, uh, that, that made me, made me able to say that I'm a a professional screenwriter now. And you know, what was really fun about the John Wick process was I had written it and it was originally entitled scorn. And, uh, the character was in his early seventies. Cause again, I love the movie Ronan. I thought, how cool would it be to grab like a Tom Lee Jones or a, you know, a, you know, just an older actor and do an action piece that made sense. Cause you know, I, I just wanted to see that. The, the dog was like 15 years old. The, the wife had passed years ago. Um, so my my agent at the time, Charlie Ferraro, who, who I love, you know, but over at UTA, he called me after the screenplay and went out. And he's like, we've got like three or four offers. And uh, I'm not going to tell you the numbers, but I really think we should take the lowest one because they want to make it now. Uh, and you know you've got a great agent who is looking at the long game. You know, It's more important for me to um, – get an okay payday in a made movie than a million dollars in no made movie. You know? And so, uh, they set it up with Basil Wanek over at Thunder Road and, you know, we developed it back and forth for a while. And then, uh, <laughs> he went out to directors and on a Friday afternoon at like one o'clock, Keanu Reeves called Basil and he's like, Hey man, I heard about this screenplay. I really like to read it. Uh, could you send it over? So they, they couriered it over and at four thirty, Keanu Reeves called back and he said, I want to do it. Now Basil called me, Again, man, I grew up with a guy, and I was I was I was excited, you know, because this is a very violent movie, and I'd love to see him do this again. And the first time I went over his house, I walked uh, past his den, and on his desk, I shit you not, were like two hundred screenplays. This guy's hobby is reading screenplays, and in that moment, it was probably the most humbling I've ever known. Going, holy shit, I was one of those, and he picked it, you know. Um, so that's how John Wick came about. And honestly, the title came about because Keanu would not refer to it as Scorn. He'd always refer to the project as John Wick and it stuck. <laughs> you know, uh, I, by, the, by the way, did you actually get to meet Keanu? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Keanu is a incredibly bright cat. I mean, you know, you, you know, you sit down with anyone and their first two notes, you're like, yeah, no shit. He got to his third note. I was like, damn it, that's better than what I had in mind, you know? And so he was, we spent a ton of time together on every character and every scene outside of his own. And he is equally responsible for what's up on that screen. I mean, Chad, Dave, Basil, Erica, I mean, this is an awesome production crew, but at his heart and soul, it's Keanu because Keanu loves the character. And, I can't, you know, honestly, I'm not pandering. You can ask around and you've probably heard stories, but he's a genuine dude. And he's, uh, you know, for instance, when we shot in New York, he got to know all the guys at the coffee shop because he would join them for their smoke breaks. And on his last day, it was like saying goodbye to uh, your best friends at camp. And you don't see that a lot with especially guys of his caliber. Yeah, I've always heard that he is an absolutely awesome guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, you know, I, my fav, my my most surreal story, like something like I'm a nice guy, but I I like being alone. He, everyone knows his address out here. You know, the, the little the little uh, buses that go by with tourists, they stop by his house and you know that kind of stuff. My favorite was one day we were working on John Wick. Uh, his doorbell rang, and he's got a little you know, uh, uh, you know, he's like, "Who's there?" And this woman says, "Hi, my name's so and so from." Boise, Idaho, or something. Uh, huge fan of yours. I just wonder how you get a picture. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so Keanu you know, goes outside and hangs out with this uh, teenage girl and her family for like five minutes taking pictures and then comes back in. Like, who does that? That's It's unbelievable. It's awesome. But that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah, I, I, that is absolutely hilarious. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, if this is true or not, but I saw that apparently he gave uh, his Matrix Two and Three money away to the special effects guys. I don't know if that's true or not, but it is true. And the uh, other thing that I thought was really cool is because you know, uh, Chad was uh, his uh, stunt double in the Matrix. Um, he Keanu hired who's the guy who makes the the custom bikes, motorcycles? The Jesse Jane? No. 
I, I'm I, talking about. Yeah, I, I, it was Jesse James for a while, wasn't it? Because I, I think I think it's Jesse James, but like Keanu as. Not only did he give away his bonus money, he had everyone on the stunt team made customized motorcycles that were delivered by Jesse James. And uh, it's just stuff like that where, you you know, he didn't have to do that. And, yeah, you could argue that he's a multimillionaire or whatever. But, again, he's just – he's a, a unique and gener- you know, generous man. And and that's you know, that's absolutely awesome. And you know, for him to get into the John Wick character, you know, when, when you finally saw the movie and you finally you know saw everything playing out, you know, what were, what were your initial thoughts when you finally <laughs> saw his finished product? That's a great question because we when we saw the friends and family, you know, the, like the first cut of the movie, with I had no idea. I, I, I because. When you get to a point in rewriting, you're not seeing words anymore. You're just seeing kind of numbers. I don't know if that makes sense. And so when we saw it, I remember looking over at, at Sonia first going, was it good? Like, I didn't hate it. I didn't, I didn't know. And she was, and she, she, by her expression, I knew it was, you know. And the, this, the, the moment that hit it home for me is we, when we did our initial screening at the Dome out here at the Arclight. Um, we're doing a Q and a afterwards and, uh, the seven, I don't know. It's 700 seats. I don't know. It was a pretty big forum, but I, you know, I showed up and I didn't watch the movie because at that point you'd seen it so many times, but I scanned the audience to find the people who didn't want to be there. And at about minute 20, everyone would have this huge grin. And, you know, my favorite movie going experience in my life. And I tell to almost everyone I meet is when the raid came out, have you seen the raid? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, when the raid came out, I loved the trailer, and I, I loved Moran too, which or I think that's the name of it, the movie he made before that. We walk into the theater with the arc light here in Pasadena. It's a smaller theater, like 130 seats, or even maybe even less. And if you looked at the audience, um, it was every sex, every age, every color, every creed. It was weird. You know, it was like a, a, a serial killer's daydream. It was bizarre. Like, if you ask people, what are they here to see? You won't know. But we sat down. It was sold out. And when the reverse door guillotine happened... I leaned forward in my seat and looked around like you did when you're 12 years old. At the end of the aisle was this 70 year old Korean man who's doing the same thing. And he pointed at me and mouth, did you see that? Oh, and when I watch people watching John Wick, especially during that house invasion and to see a guy who's uh, 68 years old, lean forward in his chair and look around that made my, that made my life, man. You know, cause that's, that's what, that's what I wanted to bring out of people. That's what I want to bring out people now, you know? Yeah, it, it, it is phenomenal the way that, that you know movies can bring people together like that. Yeah. Well, especially what I loved about you know the John Wick process or even the release was the number of older people or you know again you know it's an action movie but it's got a huge female fan base just because you know a lot of people will say uh, you'll you'll hear the term grounded which means cheap elevated which means good. You know, it's like, I want to make an elevated horror. Like, well, you want to make a good horror or a good action piece. And what I loved about the John Wick process is from this, the original spec, the bones and the muscle mass re- remain the same. It was just the skin and the hair that was massaged in by everyone involved. And uh, again, Thunder Road and the directors and Keanu and now Lionsgate, they just, you know, at any point, any production, everyone hates everybody because you're just tired. And yet, when we did that Q&A following that, you just saw the joy in going, you know, it's it's a major miracle to have a movie made. It's even more so to have it be anything good or let alone a critical and financial success. So I use the term a lot like I'm humbled and I am, you know, because, you know, you look at all the other stuff I have on my platter. It's it's horrifying because you're like, can I can I can I do what I just did? We'll see. And speaking of that, you know, I, I saw John Wick 2 was just announced. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I mean, Keanu's got the latest draft of the script, and we're going to be talking about this Sunday. Um, he loves it. I mean, the body count is probably three times bigger. And um, the, what I love about Keanu, too, is you look at a guy who – is he 50, 51? I don't remember. But he wants to do – he hates when people refer to what he does as stunts because it's not. It's him. I mean, he's really doing this stuff. And when you look at that movie and try to like, copy what he does, I can't. I'm 12 years younger than him. It's like I can't do that. And yet he beat the shit out of himself and he did it with a grin. 
and he is kind of like, you know, he sees that as like, I, I, I love that man's work ethic. And that, you know, that that's awesome. And that's indicative of everything I've always heard about Keanu was that he is, uh, you know, a guy that's willing to go the extra mile, you know? And, and so when, so I wanted to ask you is Derek is how, from what point did you start working on John Wick 2? Did you know that it, uh, I mean, did they did they immediately green light it and say get to work on it, Derek, or did you start working on it already? No, I mean, I I, I hadn't started working on it um, because when you start, when you get a movie in production, your life is rewrite hell, and it's just it's it's continual. And what I learned too is when I was out in New York on the the shoot it was hard for me to do anything else because every 10 minutes, even though you're doing very minimal labor, you have someone coming in asking, Hey, what's the nurse's name? You know, in the hospital and like, I, who gives a shit, but you know, they came to me for that. I, I spent, I spent about five weeks just playing civilization five on my laptop because I couldn't, I couldn't work on anything else, you know? And yet, um, you know, for a couple of days, every week, Keanu would come back, we'd have lunch and we'd lunch with, uh, a buddy of mine named Todd, who you know, he he does um, all the the uh, what do you call it? All the artwork, you know, all that kind of stuff. And Keanu one day asked me, he's like, "So, you know, where do you see John going next? You know, how many do you see in in your head?" And I looked at him and I was like, uh, "I got seven. Yeah, I got seven of them." And he laughed, and I pitched him two and three and four, and you could see him kind of. Not grow pale, but go, okay, let's just focus on the next one, right? Um, <laughs> and so I, I I didn't start it. And to be honest, it, it's even in, you know, even with uh, the green light, we have, we have chaotically gone between different storylines. And yet what we remain true to is I don't want to look at it, at it as a sequel. I want to look at it as, you know, John Wick chapter two, because what the Fast and Furious did so well is after the third one is they weren't sequels anymore. They were chapters. And I think those are the best, those are the best franchises to have. You know, I would, you know, Empire Strikes Back is not a sequel. It's a chapter. You know, most sequels are remakes of the first one. And with this one, you want it to be unique, but familiar, you know? Yeah, and that's that's a great way to put it too. Is, is different chapters. Yeah, I mean, and that's why you can't help but respect about the Fast and the Furious movies, even if you don't like them. Each one got better, you know, at a certain point. And you know, people ask me what I watch, and like, I got to be honest, I haven't seen it yet, but you know, I'm going to love Mad Max. I mean, I've been watching that trailer every day uh, on on a, on a deafening. Uh, TV screen with my arms out wide grinning because that's what I want to do, you know? Yeah, everyone I know who who, who has seen it has loved it. I haven't seen it yet either. Yeah. Did you did you see uh, Fast and Furious 7? I'm really behind on everything, man. And you know what I've I've learned too is when you when you write like this, uh or you get to this, you know, degree of success, I would argue, I, I don't I don't like going to the theater. Um simply because I'm alone most of the time. And when you sit down with a bunch of strangers, it's a bit of anxiety and you're watching a movie. And when you find yourself not liking it, you're suddenly reminded that people don't like what you do. It's weird. You know, I, I like, I, it's, it's weird. I mean, I love movies, man, but I like them now in the privacy of my own home. <laughs> A dad teach his own, you know, and, and sometimes I, I I I totally get what you're saying because I sometimes just like to watch movies in my own home too. Um, that's why, like, when It Follows was coming out, and they were like, "Oh, by the way, we're going to do VOD the same day as theater." I was like, "Oh, good! I can just stay home now, order a pizza, and I can watch It Follows at home." And then they pulled out the VOD, so I ended up, uh, you know, uh, because it it did better in theaters than they expected it was going to do. Yeah. So now I I I pulled up Netflix and started watching something else. Well, it's like the event movies. I, I, you know, I'll go see in the theater. And to be honest, my favorite movies to see in the theater are the ones that are aimed directly at kids because, you know, the cynicism really hasn't sunk in. And to go watch like, uh, you know, <laughs> anything by Pixar, you know, or, or a lot of the Disney stuff and to look across. And, you know, when we saw the movie Frozen, uh, it was a couple of weeks out and the little kids in front of us we're singing along to every song. And in that moment, like you could be an irritated old man or you can go like, that's movie magic. You know, these little kids love the movie so much. They're singing along and, you know, in this day, that was all. I just love that memory. And, and you know, that's what movies do. They help you give those memories. Yeah. And I mean, you think of the movies that make you cry. I was a little kid. I mean, I wept at freaking uh, 
Fox and the Hound, you know. Uh, I wept at when E.T. E. came back to life, you know. But then as you get older and older, it, it's always – it changes, like, what affects you. I think the last movie I, I cried in was Big Fish of all movies. Like, I was dating Sony at the time and it's – you know, any kind of father son die, you know, any story gets me. And when he tells his father at the end and starts breaking down, I was a blubbering mess. And it's like, you got me, man. Congratulations. Yeah, that, that's cry, man. What's the last movie that made you cry? That made me cry? Yeah. I'm not even sure. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I'd have to think about that, Derek. My favorite was uh uh, I went to go see Wally, and uh, I would argue the beginning of Wally is one of the best in cinema because it just showed you true loneliness. And as a writer, you 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 know that you 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 tap into loneliness. And I at the end of the aisle, my buddy JC, it's there's a quiet movie that I just hear I hear him wipe tears from his eyes like God damn it, Pixar, you got me again. <laughs> they they are phenomenal at that. <laughs> But they respect the process, man. They take yeah. their time. Yes. They, um, there, there's so many good points about Pixar that, like, of what they do with their stories and how, how they structure them and the characters and, the, and everything, you know, and, and it's just – that's why there's so many – I mean if you go like – speaking of screenwriting books, if you go like look online, there's so many screenwriting books now about like doing it the Pixar way or whatever. You know what I mean? And yeah. It's because you know, they are the guys you want to emulate. But also, you know, I think the best filmmakers love love their characters. You know, in the Pixar movies, you can tell that they love their characters, even the bad guys, you know. And I think that's important. I mean, what's been great in developing John Wick 2 is we love John Wick, you know. I mean, he was the Baba Yaga. He was the devil. And there may be a bit of that still inside of him. But there's something about that you love, you know. And the best movies are either the ones where everyone hated each other on the set or loved each other. <laughs> yeah, and I, I heard there's a lot of frictional Mad Max set. So, uh, oh yeah. Well, did you read that article with uh, Tom Hardy? Hardy yeah. saying, as soon as he saw the movie, he apologized to George. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's that's what I saw. Uh, and then I saw apparently like it, at the Cannes Film Festival, they were like he apologized for some of his behavior or something, or, or apparently something. There was some friction about something. Well, I, you know. I, that's a thing about the industry that a lot of people don't understand until you're really here is you can we can bemoan the fact that stars can be odd people who are assholes from time to time. But I, I do not envy their position. I mean, especially when you see it firsthand how people treat them. And I I would not, I could never live in that kind of world, you know. Did you ever do you ever see anyone ever like try to treat Keanu bad? No, it's not a matter of treating him bad, but it's it's a matter of going, hey, I recognize you from all your movies. Uh, oh, I see. I see. So we're buddies now, you know. Uh, but like when he's having dinner and just having people come up and I, you know continuously come up to him, I don't I don't get that. You know, New York is different, uh, and I'd argue uh, various sections of Hollywood are different simply because they're used to it and it's a different culture. But when you have you know people from the mid- Midwest where I come from. Um, you have two kinds. The kind who comes up to Keanu and goes, hey, I love your work, and then move on. And then it's the – or the, hey, I love your work. We're friends now, right? <laughs> so do you have a lot of friends in the Midwest calling you now and being like, hey, Derek, you sold a screenplay. I have a screenplay idea too. <laughs> you know, not really because I, I'd argue one of the greatest things about the Midwest is – you're instilled with a work ethic, but more importantly, it's like one of my best friends out here is uh, Austin O'Brien. He played the little kid in uh, Last Action Hero. You know, he's a lawnmower man and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And he's a very successful photographer now. And he was kind of stressed one day when he was going to meet my cousin, who was a big fan of his. And uh, my cousin Joanna came to a party. She walked up to him, shook his hand, and said, "Hey, I really love your movies." And they went to the kitchen to start cooking something. I don't know. That's that's what I grew up with, and I think that's awesome. But every now and then you have people come out of the woodwork, of course, and that's what's kind of nice with Facebook is you can ignore them, and yet at the same time, like the reality is no one helped me, you know. Um, and what I mean by that is, of course, people helped me, but when it came to this, to getting into the industry and the screenwriting, it was 
years of incredibly hard work and work for free to get to this point. And yet I kind of wonder, would I be the same guy had the success happen at age 30 than 40? Um, I hope so. And so a lot of times when students reach out to me or people reach out to me, those conversations tend to be very healthy because they're grounded. You know, I'm, I'm a screenwriter, man. The crazies don't come to me. <laughs> and sometimes, Derek, you have annoying people that ask you to be on a podcast. <laughs> you know what? The, I, I, what I love about podcasts, though, is this medium has given so many people like yourselves an opportunity that didn't exist 10 years ago. You know, I love that. And I mean – who knows what the next generation is going to, you know, face as well. But you have the opportunity to be and create and manage your own brand. And how cool is that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I think the next iteration is going to be robots are just going to <laughs> are going to call you and they're going to interview you, and then you know, just whoever's around will be listening to it. Um, but see, that's what I like about podcasters, though, is you're not a, you're not a cynical bunch. I mean, you're doing what you love. Uh, you know, it's one thing doing an interview for the international press. It's another, another thing doing this because we're we're fanboys to a certain degree of films themselves. You know, uh, I'm I have not seen the most movies any of any person I know yet. When I see a fellow person who loves uh, a certain movie, like you know, I asked last night on Facebook, like what movies you watch when you're down or drunk or you know alone, and my response was like, I've seen Cabin of the Woods and Evil Dead Two too many times to count. And yet when people hear that, you can kind of see the amen, brother. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just so interesting. You know, um, I remember this, 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 uh, anecdote that Kane Hodder, I don't know if you know who Kane Hodder is, but he was Jason Friday 13th from, uh, oh, seven cool. on. And, uh, he once, they actually were talking to him once and they said, who was the best actor you've ever worked with? And his response was, uh, Charlie's, uh, Charlie's Theron. And he said, she was just absolutely phenomenal monster. And he said that she just blew everyone away and he's never worked with someone. You know, it's just, it's, it was, she was just beyond, you know, what he was used to. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what a friend of mine who saw Fury Road was just like, Theron's amazing because she's looking in the rearview mirror and acting. And you're kind of like, I can't do that. Like to to have volumes of backstory in a look, it's huge, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why you know I think the movie does work. I mean, I haven't seen it. I'm just here. I'm just yeah, no, we're both behind on this one. <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, you've got Tom Hardy who's phenomenal, and you have her uh, who I think is absolutely phenomenal. I loved her in Prometheus. I don't know if you saw Prometheus. Yeah, I wasn't the biggest fan of that one, man. I loved her though. Yeah, she was. I, you know, I, 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 I just have a big soft spot for that movie. Uh, yeah. I, I know it has flaws. Well, it's like I, dude, everyone has. That's the thing is, everyone has those movies that connect to you on a certain capacity. So, there are very, there are very few movies I, I will refer to as horrendous or terrible, simply because you connected with them on a, on a on a certain level. I mean, I have movies that are indefensible, but I love them because they they uh, amuse me in a way that only that movie could. You know. Yeah, yeah, I totally, I totally understand. So you know, Derek, we've been talking for about an an hour now. I know you have, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So you know, uh, it, uh, I have one question, or actually two questions that came in from the fans. If you don't mind, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, the first question I actually uh, I, I briefly referred to earlier was about. Uh, well, the question is, and I'm just going to paraphrase this, is, you know, with a lot of talk in the industry about script consultants, where do you feel that they fit into the whole uh, screenwriting process? You know, it's hard for me because I'm Sony is my script consultant, you know, and so uh, between her and Josh Adler, who's my manager, um, you know, that's that's where I've gone. But I would argue that, you know. My dad used to say the phrase that when you bring in someone to do a, a job and you're getting a, a quote, get five quotes, you throw out the biggest one, you throw out the, the lowest one. And with script consulting is if you look at the numbers, if it makes sense for you, great. And a lot of times, especially nowadays, you can find some good ones that all you need is to hear back both that criticism and encouragement make you better. You know, I would argue that a lot of us have people who serve the, the script consultation uh, capacity in some respect, but for the pros, they're reading tons of scripts. They know that they know, they know what's selling. They know what's not. And I think even though I haven't done it before, I can see the value in it. 
just don't spend in you know an un- ungodly amount you know so in, in your opinion you know what's like do you think there should be like a cap of like a hundred dollars a thousand dollars something like that well I, I, you know you can't really say a figure because who is it you know um you know at a certain point like if if you buy uh a luxury ice cream container for eight dollars. You're like, oh, sweet. Would you buy it for eighty? Fuck no, it's ice cream. At a certain point, what is it that you're buying? You know. Very true. Uh, just as a as a funny side note, I actually just saw in uh, I think it was Abu Dhabi or um, uh, somewhere in the Middle East. They actually have ice cream now that's like a thousand dollars an ounce. <laughs> What's in it? Uh, gold flakes, <laughs> di- diamonds, right. and um, caviar and something else but it's but it's like the way they make it is they it's all freeze dried right so they make it literally they make it right in front of you from scratch everything from scratch except so not, not not the diamonds of course but like the ice cream and then what they do is they put it into this uh they mix it up with everything and then they top it with gold flakes <laughs> i i don't know who told me this years ago but they're like it was when uh the Trump hotel, I think was serving up this $800 hamburger, you know? And he said, if I ever found myself, uh, wondering about that burger and ordering it, I should just give that money away. And I think that's the truth for most of life. Like if I find myself wanting to buy a Bentley, I should give that money away if I had it. So, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, uh, although I would say I probably would buy a Bentley. Um, <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. Um, Joe Esterhaus once said that uh, there's a there's a great way if you're ever stuck on a screenplay he has found the perfect way to get unstuck and and cure writer's block and he said what you do is you go down to find your local um, exotic car dealer and you either get like a Lamborghini or Ferrari and you take it out for the weekend and he said well by the time you get back you're going to do anything in your power to make sure you can buy one so you can drive that again <laughs> I like that uh, yeah, and, and uh, I'm actually trying to get him on the podcast. By the way, um, might be a little. Is he, a little, still, little... Is he still writing? Or I, oh, you yeah. know, I, I know he kind of had a big blow up at the industry and kind of took a, took some time off. Oh, yeah, he's still writing. Okay, sweet. And because uh, his he, his last work was actually a book. It's an ebook called Heaven and Mel, and it's all about working with Mel Gibson. <laughs> nice. And uh, the the other question that came in, uh, Derek, was how do I go about getting a screenplay mentor? Good question, man. Um, I, if I look at my my own life, um, find someone in your life who reads, you know, uh, and reads voraciously. Simply because when you read, uh, you you know what's good, you know what's you know what works, and you know the other thing too is. My thing about screenwriting, especially in the industry, I said at the beginning, is you have to be here. I know you can hate L.A. and hate New York even, but you have to be here. Uh, You could honestly move to L.A. right now, jump online and find a group of people who will read your screenplay in 48 hours because they're trying to do the same thing. And it's kind of like the brotherhood of the script. And, you know, that's the, the be- if you really want to see if you can fail at this move here, you know, but if you don't and you want uh, advice, seek out the people who love the medium. And uh, it's amazing, too. The other thing, too, is you'll know if you have a good script when you have your friends sit around and read it out loud, because it's amazing, especially with comedy, something that intimidates the shit out of me, um, where. It's funny to you. It's funny on the page. And when it's, when it's spoken out loud, it's just like gravel, you know? And uh, that's what I'd say on that, man. Hey, that's a very good point. Uh, did, by the way, Derek, just to sort of add on to that, did you see The Blacklist has its own podcast now where they're actually reading some like unproduced screenplays? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's a really cool idea, man. Yeah, the uh, the first one they did was uh, Balls Out. Oh, I've heard, I haven't read that one. I've heard of it. Uh, somebody once told me about it, and then I heard Craig Mazin mention it again. Um, Craig Mazin, I don't, you, you know who he is, right? Yeah. Okay, so like he mentioned it, and I looked it up, and I was like, wow, it was easy to find. And apparently it's been circling around Hollywood for years, but nobody actually wants to make it. Uh, but everyone's like, this is fucking hilarious. Ha, ha, ha. And then they just pass it on. And and it's been like, why the hell? So uh, apparently it does get like pretty outrageous and stuff. So I'm actually going to read it one of these days, but I've, I've read the first 20 pages, and I thought it was hilarious. Like, Have you read the screenplay Passengers? No, I haven't. 
dude, that's that's one right now. I, I think I think Chris Pratt's attached. I don't know who the, the female lead is right now. Um, that's one that every exec I talk to is like, that's the best screenplay I've read in five years. But we passed on it. And the realities of this business are, it's like, let's say you read a screenplay and it's your favorite ever, but you're like, that's a $120 million, uh, you know, PG-13 R-rated sci-fi thriller uh, that's unique. You know, it's not based on anything. Uh, you know, you've got shareholders, man. It's it's a huge risk. So when people pass on certain stuff, like I've talked to a number of people who passed on Gravity. You're like, well, how? And then you realize, oh, yeah, if you hadn't seen the visuals and were reading, I get it, you know? And yet every now and then, especially being an aspiring writer like yourself, Oh, fuck that. You're a writer, you know, uh, is when you go to the, 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 the theater and you're like, you get 12 minutes into a movie. You're like, how was this made? And a lot of times, even the people involved, like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's a there's another podcast too uh, called How Did This Get Made, and um, I love they, that one. Yeah. Oh, they, they, yeah, and and I, I first I was like, what the hell? But um, but yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. You know, they they even mentioned you know what the hell happened here. But uh, you know, it's funny, Derek. Remember Land of the Lost when that came out with Will Ferrell? Yeah, yeah. that that studio they they put they booked so much on that, and then what happened was when it failed, everyone got fired. <laughs> yeah, and that. That's the kind of thing, though, that you can, you, you feel for certain people involved. Because I remember talking to the producers of uh, Jonah Hex, mm-hmm. and uh, they they you know this was after the fact, and they were like, Derek, the screenplay was fun. It was it was a blast. Uh, the table reads were great. Three weeks before shooting, they carved off like fifteen million dollars of our budget. We thought we'd do fine, and then when we started seeing dailies, we were like, what happened? It's just again, it's a miracle when you get a good movie. And it's simply because, you know, it's I, it, it begins and ends with a script, sure. But at certain points, people step in and uh, the script gets muddied and things happen, you know. And often you've seen a bad movie that's only bad when it hits the second act, you know. That's more often than not. Yeah, very true. Uh, yeah, something I've always heard is uh, the, the second act is where movies go to die. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would argue that the, the movies I write, the, I mean, I love just action. I love thrillers. I love sci-fi. The work is in act two. I mean, act one, you come up with your, when you're out for a walk or you're, you're having a meal. Act three is just fun because you can finish the fucker. But act two, that's where the writing comes in, man. And when you start receiving notes, all your notes are in act two, not one or three. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, Derek, in closing, uh, you know, I, I mean, we could talk all day, uh, you and I. I could tell we have, you know, we have, we have the same taste in movies. We've got, we're both. Well, give, a, give a shout when the, the next film comes out, man. Okay, definitely. Because, uh, you know, we both have degrees in business. We both do writing. Uh, we both have red hair. Um, <laughs> Losing my, I shaved my head. <laughs> My, uh, but thank you for that writer comment, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, well, that's I'm, the thing is like, I, I always have to stop myself because it's kind of what Keanu said about, he doesn't do his, he doesn't do stunts. He's really doing it. And so when I talk to people, it's like, you're not to say you're an aspiring screenwriter means you want to be a screenwriter who's being paid, but to be a writer is to be a writer. And as soon as you have one person read it, you've affected their entire life. And I think it's, it's a difficult uh, career, and yet it's a uh, it's a fun one. And I'm not saying John Wick is going to be out there changing people's lives, but I want to make movies that, like Predator, Die Hard, for instance, where you're at a, you're at a hotel one night. It's 11 o'clock. You're tired. You turn on the TV. It's halfway through Predator, and you're like, "Fuck, I gotta watch it." Those are the movies I love. I mean, I remember when I when I beyond the commercials for John Wick, uh, I was on Facebook one day, and a friend of mine who's kind of a, a hard guy to please with movies actually was like John Wick, and he wrote you know dot 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 the ellipsis, and he wrote that was pretty fucking good. And- <laughs> See, that's the best. That's what I want, you know. And in fact, I had people on Facebook who were like in their uh, late seventies, early eighties, friends of my grandmother who hadn't seen an R-rated movie since maybe The Godfather. They went to see it to support me, and they're just like, that, I really enjoyed that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, there's a couple things in John Wick. Like I said, people, if you're listening to this, told you I was going to dig into it. But just you know, real quick, so I know you, know you have to go. But when, when John Wick you know, is going through the nightclub and he's you 
the all action scene and we're following the whole time and it's just everything about that we just all came together beautifully and I was well, like and I was like damn that's a really good action scene right there yeah and what's fun is uh, you know Chad and Dave their background is you know is is stunt direction and that kind of stuff but what I loved about working with them and what I love about working with them now is a lot of the action beats I wrote into the script are on the screen like to see that John shoots that guy's foot and he leans forward and shoots his head. I'm like, that was in the screenplay. And so I know for a lot of like the Marvel movies or the bigger properties, they say John Wick fights 15 guys. Like in the script, they gave me the opportunity to help them along the action, action wise. And what I love about their uh, directing style is there's no quick cuts. They're doing all of these moves. They're landing all of these blows. And it's it's kind of like an ode to the Kung Fu I grew up with, you know? And we had fun with it then, and we're going to have a blast with it in the next. And is there a rough date for or the release date for the next one? Not, re- not, not really. Uh, Lionsgate really wants one. Uh, they're they're talking with various people in Cannes right now. So we, we could shoot in the fall, or we could shoot in the spring. Um the Lionsgate has been very, very generous. I mean, it's very rare to be in a place where you have a greenlit movie, you know, and it's greenlit and they're like, the sooner the better. And yet they want to massage this into a franchise. And Keanu, who's, you know, implicit in all of this, is very careful to do so as well. And that, that's absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, Derek, I want to say congratulations on all your success. Um, you, you know, you've definitely earned it. And, you know, I, I wish you nothing but the best with, you know, John Wick 2 and hopefully John Wick 3 and, uh, you know, all the other future projects you have. Dude, thanks a lot, man. I enjoy talking to you. Oh, I believe it's my pleasure, man. Anytime I can get talking about like movies, like anyone who's seen Mansquito or <laughs> or, or or Kill Dozer or Future, oh, or, my you see Rubber? Yes, I did see Rubber. Yes, I loved Rubber though, but uh, you know, if you ever really want to punish yourself, and this goes for, for not only you, Derek, but anyone listening, if you want to see the worst film that I've ever seen, I know exactly what it is, and it's called Nuki. What? Nuki. It's N U K I E. And okay. it's a movie about two aliens that crash land in Africa. And it is, it was supposed to be like a kid's movie, like a ripoff of E.T. And it is so odd and bad and boring and dead. It's it, it's it's hailed as you know they usually have the worst movies ever made. Uh, they usually put Plan Nine on, but Plan Nine is actually entertaining. This <laughs> this is just bad. So <laughs> so if you ever and I'll link to it in the show notes too. If anybody actually wants to venture out to see Nuki, but it it is absolutely bar none the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. Uh, have you seen Martyrs? Martyrs, no. That is one of the most disturbing horror movies I've ever seen. So. Okay, I'll make I'm making a note of that. <laughs> that and uh, Three Extremes is awesome. Yeah, I have seen extre- uh, Three Extremes. Yeah, and uh, could go for hours, man. Yeah, seriously. I mean, we could always be talking. I mean, that, that's uh, that's what happens when you find you know find you know, somebody like yourself and, who, who just has seen all these random movies that I've seen. Uh, and I'm going to check out that movie Casablanca you mentioned. I don't know. I've... <laughs> hey, when you're out, man, give me a shout, dude. <laughs> Uh, will do, Derek. And oh, Derek, where can people find you out online? Uh, nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do Twitter or anything. Okay, uh, so it's- <laughs> I, I just I, I I I'm just a private guy, man. Uh, cool, and uh, you know, everyone you can find me at DaveBulls dot com. Uh, you can you can find you can uh, find me. I'm a uh, I try to be private, but I got way too much social stuff going on. You know what I mean? I got I've got two channels. Um, but actually, uh, Derek, I want to say thanks again for coming on. And uh, please, anytime you want to come back, just let me know. Sure thing. Good luck and all, man. Oh, thank you very much, man. See you, buddy. Take care, buddy. Bye. Find Dave at DaveBulls dot com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.